I wonder if you could uh, imagine yourself 50 years from now, and if you could tell us what your dreams are for how we're interacting with technology, and how, let's first talk about how technology is uh, making our lives happier. Dark Witch, you want to start with, with, your, with your dream? Can you hear me um, if I talk like this, or do you prefer the mic? Mic is better. Mic. Okay. Mic. I mean, oh, mic. Hi. Hello. Um, technology makes me happy. I just, I don't know, I just find it so fascinating that we have this um, new way to communicate with people all over the world. And I think we can see it's changing social systems in the world. and. Um, it's you know there's so many questions about is it for the is it for good is it for bad is it for better is it for worse but um, I'm I'm kind of it, as a person I'm engaged in the question of is it for better is it for worse but as a writer I'm just engaged in the question of itself and, and what it does to relationships and um, and I'm kind of interested in exploring. Like I, with the play, I started with morality, and I moved into personal communication and intimacy. So um, I'm kind of happy that technology has, as a writer, given me so many different ways to explore <coughs> how people communicate and the kind of relationships we develop. But is, is this is is this for recording? Do that's, I need yeah, this? that's for the video, and that's for the live people. Here. Okay. Well, I actually, I can take your question very literally, if you don't mind. No, please. Yeah. Fifty years from now, I will be eighty-five years old, and I actually have a fantasy for when I'm eighty-five um, that involves my husband Kiyosh, which is we had to stop playing World of Warcraft after we've been playing it for about a week, um, and postpone it till retirement. Um, and our plan, our whole, our hope is that when we're old enough that our bodies no longer allow us to run half marathons or walk around the block, or is it maybe, um, and when we may feel too old for society to take us seriously or want to hear what we have to say um, <laughs> on a stage, that there will be a game like World of Warcraft where we can be mentally engaged, where we can have a purpose, where we can serve others by joining them on a raid, um, you know, that we could, we could fulfill some purpose and, and have social connection and meaning and something to wake up for every day. And in my mind, when, you know, when I'm older and maybe sick or disabled, that, that a game, a virtual game, might allow me to do that. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that many of us who are, seem to be, you know, we should be living in the real world because there's nothing stopping us, still feel that there might be more ways to be of service or more ways to connect with strangers, um, which in Jennifer's play, which by the way, um, have seen mm -hmm. and she saw um, a, a first run through this yeah afternoon. and I will say um, and you can tweet this it's mm -hmm. it's the bravest play that I've seen I'm a Broadway junkie that I've yeah. seen in a decade easily um, so everybody go it's, it's, it's shockingly brave um, and uh, and truthful um, but I think a lot of people have that sense that we um, we might find meaning and connection in virtual worlds um, that are lacking in our real lives even before we're almost 100. So wait, you guys played World of Warcraft for a week and then you said, no, we can't do this anymore? <laughs> Pretty, two weeks, whatever, whatever. It was like basically by level 20, we realized um, <laughs> it would like- I got out at level 47. Did you? <laughs> We were like literally the first time we sat down to play. It was in the it was at lunchtime. It was we we looked up. It was 3 a.m. Our dog hadn't been out. He had to go to the, the corner store to buy Cheetos for us. So we had like Cheetos. I'm a vegan. We had Cheetos for dinner at three in the morning. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> um, we decided we didn't want to do that until we were much older. <laughs> yeah. That that you know I could look forward to being older. It, We'll like be the, the idea of like just being able to play something like World of Warcraft all day long, not feeling guilty. About you actually all. talk, Jane. You talk about yeah. in the book actually about games for senior citizens and yeah. a way that engages them back in the real world it, when when they've been told to disengage. Yeah, and by the way, do I think it would be better to design society so that 
elderly individuals are brought into meaningful social, like, yes, you know, in some societies. There's a great new book out called, what, by Jared Diamond, called What We Can Learn From, does anybody remember the rest of it? What We Can Learn From Developing Societies or something like that. Um, and other societies that do a better job of integrating uh, their oldest members into real life and things that they're good at, like cooking or um, caring for, for the children. So that would probably be better than World of Warcraft. I think that's a, that's a tension that, that the play kind of deals with, which is um, are, there, are, there, are there people who, sh who can be served in reality? By real relationships and real work, that we should be, you know, pointing them towards, or or is virtuality a reasonable <coughs> substitute? You led the notion of escape. Is it is because I think a lot of people who, uh, I think parents who are afraid of how much their kids are playing games, are worried that they're escaping from real life. And is there a possibility that as virtual worlds or gaming becomes more and more lifelike, that we will escape more and more and be less responsible towards the world around us. And is that something you're worried about? Yeah. <laughs> I see your play and I worry about it. Everyone's more scared of my play than I am. <laughs> Because to me, it's fantasy. You know, it's complete. It's a complete projection. It's a complete sort of fantastical uh, projection of an extreme, extreme scenario. I, I mean, my feeling about virtual reality and gaming is I feel the same way about it that I feel about alcohol or driving fast sometimes or you know, um, it's it's kind of how much you do it. It's really up to the individual to decide. Um, what their, where their boundaries are. My little brother uh, was in World of Warcraft for like six years straight, and I mean like summertime, his schedule, and my parents allowed this, his schedule was get up at 1 p.m., um, you know, get some lucky charms and hit the, hit the computer, and he'd be up until 6 a.m., you know, all day and until 6 a.m., and then he'd go to bed. Like that was his schedule all summer long for two or three, four summers in a row. And he, after six years of gaming, and I think it was because he was starting to get his heart broken. He had a girlfriend in Maine, and then he had a girlfriend in Colorado that he met. That he met again. through Rumble through the game. Oh. Yes, yes. And these girls like <laughs> broke his heart. And really, he, he finally, he literally quit the game cold turkey. He turned like 20, 20, 20 and um, was like, you know what? I want a real girlfriend, and um, my grades suck, and um, I'm going to, and he doesn't play any games at all anymore. Very, and it kind of watching him do that. I felt like, you know, people are people need to assume a certain amount of responsibility. People can, people have it within them to draw their own boundaries and assume a certain amount of responsibility for themselves and what they want and what they do. Well, you mean talk about the girlfriends in the game. The most interesting conversation I think that we've had um, about the play and, and what's going on in virtual spaces is. The question of can you have love and truly meaningful relationships, not only with someone you've never met, but with someone who may, you know, you, you may not you may not know. I mean, you only know what they show you and who they are in that game. Um, and we know people are doing this on Facebook, falling in love with people who they've never met. Um, and is, is the quality of emotional interaction sufficient to have real love and real well, power? We don't have to be that truthful about who we are when we present ourselves, and also the other person can be. And can you love someone you've never touched? Can you love someone you've never seen? Mm -hmm. um, we got very philosophical about it. In fact, we're like, let's imagine that you were blind and deaf and <laughs> had no sensation due to some terrible accident, you know, could you love somebody? Like to try to take it to an extreme. Um, but I think that's something a lot of people are grappling with mm -hmm. in real life, is the intensity of emotions we feel to people we've never met. Um, and is that good for us and is it real? Like so he says I wanted a real girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe he had, I mean, 
did he have broke? He might have. What, why, why was His that? His heart was broken, it seems to me. Yeah, weird. exactly. That heartbreak exactly. sounds real mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the girls broke up with him. And he had real feelings. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally had real feelings. Yeah. I got the phone calls. He's a wonderful little brother. He would call me up and tell me about the girl in Maine. And, and I would just keep, you know, I'd be like, well, Gary, you might want to try a real girlfriend. And, you know, so there is that. I think. I think we do, I think there is importance, and there's one character in the play in particular who's like, thinks there's a real importance in us keeping, being able, the reason she doesn't like the code that replicates sensation is because she feels like if you erase all boundaries between what is real and what is not, then your emotions, <coughs> then, then your emotions, your sense of love, your sense of who you are, there's absolutely nothing to base it on anymore. That the actual physicality of our lives and the and the, the rules of the world that the, the world dictates of you do X Y you know you do X and you do A and then B happens. That those are important for not just our physical well-being but our emotional well-being too. A sense of consequence. Um, and then I think what the characters start to discover is that even even when in, in an environment where there seemingly are no rules in a, a virtual environment, the emotions of the people involved with that world itself feel the consequence. So then, um, you know, I guess the discussion could be what is the power, what, what are our emotions, what is the power of our emotions, our emotions are real, is love real, if, if you feel it but the other person doesn't, what is, you know, yeah. yeah, is there anything more real than emotion, than the than what you feel? I mean, I, I, I come out of the play and oh, out of looking at a lot of games thinking that what I feel in a virtual world or game is as real as what I feel in this room, um, in that it's the physiological experience that happens in my mind and my body, and you can't take that away. So if you make me feel a certain way in a virtual world or game, <coughs> that is real. Yeah, and your brain apparently can't differentiate between right. a, a, an imagined experience or a virtual experience and a real experience. Right. Okay, the processes know, are the same. That's true. Even if, um, I don't know if you guys, how much neuroscience you follow, but there's... Um, All neuroscientists. Yes. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you have somebody, um, you know, uh, shoot basketballs and you watch what's going on in the brain, um, and then you have them just stand there and imagine really intensely shooting the, the basketball, fires exactly the same neurons in the brain. There's no difference. Um, and in fact, on, the, on our Tumblr site, actually you should know about this, mm-hmm. the netherplay.com, usually when I dramaturgical play, I put together a dramaturgical packet. Jen, who's a web designer, had a great idea of creating a Tumblr site mm-hmm. for the creative team and for the audience to I just... I stole it from a play in, at the National At theater. the National <laughs> But you were the first American woman to come up with it. And so basically, everyone, the actors, the designers, and we just uploaded a, a number of articles and pictures related to the play uh, that would interest us. And one of the articles um, and video is of a, of a person who uses a wheelchair, who's a quadriplegic, right? Who, um, through... Uh, is able to use her, her, I can't forget, uh, um, use her her brain to actually move, uh, to move herself in a virtual world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, we're already, the, the, the link between technological and organic is already starting to happen. There's another one of, uh, I don't know if you saw this, this is very recent, of new goggles that allow certain blind people to see. And the way that interface happens is that there's a camera here <coughs> and a sheet of electrodes implanted in the back of the retina. Yeah. And the electrodes, the brain recognizes the pixels and the blind person can differentiate between black and white. So that, that's already happening. That's the, the real or technology. <coughs> so what? That, and it's stuff like that that makes me love technology. Yeah. But what happens if, will we ever, will we ever not be able to tell the difference between what's real and what's not, and is it important that we keep that in mind? Well, what do, what do we even mean? I mean, yeah. so I think you could say it's possible in virtual worlds and games that there could be a billion competing versions of reality. Um, so there might not be a shared reality, a single shared reality, but um, 
from a purely cognitive, physical, emotional perspective, I think the research is starting to suggest that your life could be lived in such a way that you have a very similar experience to reality. It's just you might be all by yourself, which I think that's an interesting, I don't know, philosophical or ethical question to think about. Is, is it worth having a reality if you're having it by yourself or with one other person? I mean, is, maybe that becomes ultimately what we miss most is the sense of, and it's just funny because people go into a lot of these spaces because they're lonely. So would you even really want this perfect world that only you experience because you've designed it for your personal pleasure? I think there's something, there's something about the shared aspect, the shared reality. Like no matter who that person is in real life, if you share an online game together, is when I was playing World of Warcraft, I would play with a friend of mine on the East Coast, and it was just so much fun. This is someone who I talked to once every three months, and now I was playing with her three nights a week. You know, we weren't trying to catch up furiously in an hour-long phone call. What have you been doing for three months? It was like, let's go kill these wolves, okay? <laughs> and it was so. I felt very close to her. We had the shared reality yeah. of killing wolves in, in World of Warcraft, and you know, um, I don't think there was. I really enjoyed it. I still look back fondly on those days. Um, I really, it's like an era, the era I played World of Warcraft. And Antoinette <laughs> and I played World of Warcraft together. Um, but there's something about the sharing, and even, like, I really like it if, when I put something out on Facebook, like about this event or, or, or about the play or, or something even that happened to me that day, and I get, you know, five different people in different time zones who are like, oh, Jen, the same thing happened to me. Or, you know, just that one bit of, I feel like even in that little bitty space, we have a, a quiet shared reality. And, you know, we've been talking about the football player, Teo, mm -hmm. how he had a whole emotional <coughs> thing with someone who wasn't real, someone who didn't die. He just knew the story in his head and he had a totally emotional response to that. But you know, when he was, when, when those two people were in contact, no matter who they thought the other person was, they had the shared reality of those conversations. Yeah, and we went really far with it um, in terms of, I, you know, I confess that I probably had relationships like that in college where in my mind, I was in love with this person who was in love with me, and, but that was just me projecting my story of what we were experiencing. And you never oftentimes in young college love. You know, somebody's not being totally truthful or the intensity of emotion on one side is more than the other. And so in a way, romantic love is always fictional and, you know, uh, about you. and about you. So uh, that makes me feel much more comfortable with, you know, catfish relationships and being in love with somebody in a virtual world you've never met. And um, I think, it's I think the, tragedy. no, I think the fine line is, is there someone behind the persona? If it were like, if I found out it was an artificial intelligence, I would think we'd gone too far. But I think that's, because what's, what's, what your play is about is about relating and connecting. And if there were, this is not, I don't think this is fair to say, your play is not about shockingly discovering everybody is a cyborg avatar and nobody's real. Like that would be a totally different story, in which case I think we, that would be a great cautionary tale and we should like turn off, like, turn off um, Watson. IBM Watson and stop it now um, so that we can have love with real people and not just with, with but as long as there's a real person behind the Facebook page or behind the avatar you're having a real relationship whether it's who you think they are or whether they care as much as you do it's as real as any others we talked briefly uh, uh, last hour about anonymity and I, I find what does scare me a little bit about what technologies affords us is uh, the chance to behave anonymously and to say things anonymously and I think if you've ever had the misfortune of spending a lot of time reading the LA Times comments it's horrifying because they're not mediated and only the angriest people post there uh, and I, I don't understand why that's allowed and there's um, a great Twitter um, account called don't read the comments oh, really? and you can follow it and it will remind you every day don't read the comments. Yeah. it's heartbreaking but it does seem that uh, when when people know that they can do things without anybody finding out who they are, it some for some people it brings out I think their darkest side, uh, and that scares me. But Jane, you said that actually anonymity is 
actually becoming a thing of the past? Well, so I mean, people behaving badly in virtual and online spaces seem to be getting outed by the community more and more. Um, you know, trolls on, I don't even want to say their name because I don't want them coming after me. You know what I'm talking about. Um, if you don't, be happy that you don't. Um, you know, they get outed um, through the real identity um, because they've gone too far. Um, more people who are doing, you know, um, catfish, um, you know, scams get outed. Um, or, uh, you know, things that you said get recorded by somebody and posted on Facebook. Um, so most people I know in internet and social media and, and, and technology are having arguments now about, come on, we need to save anonymity because everything looks like it's going in the direction of um, less, whether it's because we give over more of our lives or we're comfortable with people wearing, you know, Google glasses and like, recording everything around us and getting everything that we say and see gets uploaded to a search engine in the future, you're going to be able to Google, you know, uh, what did Jane see the night of August 3rd, 2017, and know where I was and who was, when, if I was stupid enough to film it, you know. Um, so uh, yes, I think in the future there will be less blanket anonymity for us to behave badly, is my, is my thinking. Does anonymity bring out the worst in many people? Yeah, so there's new social science suggesting that for many people it brings out the best. Um, I don't know, I can't remember the lab, but there's just in the last couple months, um, anonymity brings out the best. Somebody look that up. Yeah, somebody look it, look up, it up on your phone and see if you can find it and we'll, we'll name the research lab. <laughs> Oh, so Jared Diamond book is What Can We Learn from Traditional Societies? This is great. We're going to show the power of technology. Yeah, right now. We'll forget everything we were trying to think of and we'll uh, crowdsource it for us. Um, but yeah, they did this you know, experiment where people were allowed to do something nice for others and they would know that they'd done it, or they could do it anonymously and nobody would know that they'd done it, and they were more generous in the anonymous mm -hmm. context. Because you do derive a lot of pleasure from altruistic behavior. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you know, whatever. And what's really interesting, and now we're just going to go down to social psychology bent slightly. Um, a lot of people know the study, the Stanford Prison Experiment, um, that Phil Zimbardo did, where they turned, you know, virtual prison guards into monsters who terrorized the people um, who were playing prisoners. We commissioned the plan. Yeah, and sure. right. And people heard about that, and for years they have <coughs> internalized this idea that. If given a little bit of power, we turn into monsters. Like Lord of the Flies. Yes. Right. He has spent the rest of his career trying to point out that they did another experiment at the same time in which people played nurses rather than prison guards, and it brought out wonderful, caring, nurturing roles. They had the same amount of power over them, but it was just the context and, and what they were, the way we associate a nurse versus a guard, um, but exactly the same uh, experimental. Uh, setting, so um, the we should just think about you know human nature. Uh, we if you tell a story enough about human nature is terrible and it will come out and be these horrible monsters, and you don't tell the other story, I think we start to internalize that as a society and how we're supposed to act when given anonymity or power. So. That also, also makes me think though that the role you are assigned literally affects your behavior. Though. Yes. It makes me think of avatars too. Mm -hmm. Yes. That the avatar you choose can also affect your behavior. Yeah. Either virtually or in real life. Yeah, right? and the Stanford had um, Stanford University's virtual um, interaction lab just published research this year <laughs> showing that if you play um, a game with an avatar that has superhero powers like flying um, you are more altruistic in the 24 hours afterwards, more likely to help somebody who falls, help them pick up or whatever. Um, so it does, when I think about your play, and I think some of the things people are doing in the nether are what we would consider, as you said, testing the boundaries of morality. Um, that is the one thing I do worry about. Um, even though if you ask me, you know, do violent video games cause people to be violent, I would say no, the research is no, blah, blah, blah. But if you're going to accept that heroic games inspire us to be altruistic because the stories we tell about heroes are that they're good guys, I think there's something in there. If you constantly are playing a bad guy in a virtual world, you might internalize that and start to 
think about yourself differently. So it might not change your behavior one to one. I, I beat up a guy in this game, so I beat up a guy in real life. But maybe you see yourself as an anti-hero instead of a hero, and it would change how you, so I, I do think it's interesting like to explore. It's some, it's some power suggestion. I was saying this year, 2013, one of my resolutions was I'm not going to read the news this year. Um, Start a Twitter account for that. Don't read the news. <laughs> Don't read the news. Yeah. I mean, I still hear the big news. I see it on Facebook, and my friends tell me about it, so I don't feel like I'm out of the loop. But what I don't do is sit down for half an hour in the morning and read the news and be like, oh my God, it's terrible. The world is terrible, and everyone's terrible, and I hate everyone. It's all for naught. So, and it really, I'm really, I really start off my days a lot better these days because I'm not reading the news, and that's just basic sort of. And I thought about, I'm sure someone's done this, to start a, start a, you know, publication that's only good news, you know, it's like, I'm going to start something called Good News, and everyone can contribute articles about, you know, good articles and inspirational articles. It's not like I want to live in a fantasy world that everything is good, but I know that the news I'm reading is just really tilted towards the, the negative. And it influences my, I found influencing my entire day. I would spend an, an hour locked in an inner diatribe against, you know, you know, someone who'd done something and another. But apparently we like to time. consume it. I mean, I think people would say it's also because the more fearful we are, the more easily manipulated we are. And it's mm -hmm. easier to sell us stuff when we're scared mm -hmm. also. Um, and your play is called The Nether. I mean, it's not, you know. <laughs> I don't the elevated, you know, <laughs> ideal. <laughs> that's, what's, because that's what's hilarious, because I don't, yeah, <laughs> all my plays are traditionally pretty darn dark, but... Um, that's true. How did you decide to call the internet? How did the internet become the nether? How did that image come to you? How did that I don't know how the title came to me. It just, yeah, it was just, I thought, it, I was thinking netherworld, I think. And, yeah, it was definitely had an underworld type feeling. But it was felt. It felt like the tone of the play. It felt, you know, a bit removed. It's it's not a term we use regularly, uh -huh. so slightly futuristic to me and dark, <clears throat> which is the tone of the play. So in the play too, is I I don't think it's revealing too much to say that the future of the play, the environment is degraded mm -hmm. to such an extent that the virtual world is much richer in sensation mm -hmm. than the world outside because we have not taken care of the world outside. Mm -hmm. Do you, are you do you are you afraid that might happen? I'm not afraid we're not going to take care of the world because we're in virtual environments. I'm afraid we're not going to take care of the world just because we're too you know locked in our own patterns. I mean, <clears throat> I myself, <laughs> you know, I can't be like, hey, you know, quit coming down those trees and quit, you know, big oil companies. You know, I'm driving in my car across LA. You, like you, those you, bad you, oil companies. You, you know, walk stop around with your own down. utensils. Jen has her own utensils in her bag. She uses what she does. It's almost feels like a fetish, but I'm like, no, it's great. I'm not using plastic utensils. <laughs> 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 to go where dot com. They're awesome. They come in a little, you get a bamboo fork and spoon and knife and chopsticks. <laughs> She's got them. You got them. Yes. I just take them everywhere in my purse and I don't use plastic cutlery anymore. And it's probably something, it's probably like getting points in a video game. I use them. So I actually have a game for you what hearing you talk about you know you can't go tell the people not to cut down the trees um, it's a great project that just launched um, I didn't make it so this is an unbiased rave review um, called half the sky has anybody seen the game yes. for this yet um, I read the book, yeah so it's there was a game. right so it's related to the half the sky project about um, empowering girls around the world to get educated and, and join the economic uh, workforces um, around the world and they made a Facebook game which uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a little simulation. You learn mm -hmm. about the, the troubles of women in parts of the world where they're not educated or, or not allowed to get jobs. But you do something in the game, and uh, instead of just getting uh, an achievement badge, you know, congratulations, um, it says, hey, because you completed that mission, we are going to send a real book to a girl in Pakistan. And uh, this is the book we're sending, and it's because you finished that mission. And uh, the more you play, the more, you know, we're going to send medicine, we're going to send supplies, and uh, every mission you undertake will actually, um, and, uh, you know, there's at least half a million dollars in um, real world actions that can be unlocked in, in the next month. So um, uh, you, then you could maybe, I mean, it's not cutting down trees, but it's, you could be in the virtual world, and it's social, so you could, you know, call up your friend 
who did you, what was her name that you played? Antoinette. Antoinette. Get Antoinette in the game. You can do your co-op again, um, but then you can also be um, helping, you know, make the world better. So half the sky on Facebook. Maybe suggest uh, a way that those two things might be balanced um, and it's a beautiful in the future. Book. It's like uh, Nicholas Kristoff wrote it with his wife. Yeah. Uh, which I think is a good segue to talk about women and technology and uh, coding. Uh, so a figure that I read recently is that at least 40% of, of people who consume games are women. But something like 3% of the actual coders are women. Oh, yeah, code, in the whole industry it's 6%. I imagine for the actual um, programmers it's So, you know, it's an obvious concern that if we're saying that technology is going, it's changing our world, so it's going to create better worlds for us. Uh, it seems that 94% of the population is going to create these new worlds for us. Uh, and what, did, what does that mean? That, that still to this day, men are creating <coughs> these interfaces. And is that going to continue? And how do we change that? What happens if we don't change that? For instance, I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that the chances are that the person who developed the Half the Sky game is more likely than not perhaps a woman, maybe. Am I making a There are a lot of women involved in the project. I actually don't know um, who the development team is. Look it out, look it out. Yeah. <laughs> Did you find that other study, by the way? No. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's an interesting yeah. question. I mean, I think women are involved in the development of these things, but does it make most, sense? Most, there's not that many women in tech companies, and most of them who are, are in PR and marketing. That's right, yeah. Oh. It's a, but it's an interesting question to me of, does it make a difference to have more women involved in code? Yes. Which is kind of like, you know, the coders are pretty much given the project specs, and that's what they have to realize. So does having women making code, I mean, it's, it's kind of a fascinating thing to think about what would code even be like if it were generated by women? Yeah. Because the way code, like what is, there's certain, there's code that's elegant, there's code that's inelegant, there's code even as its own language. Like, I hadn't thought about that till right now. I mean, really it's the programmers who decide what's possible. And so when you say, if there are no women involved in the coding, then there are no women involved in having the final say on what the system can do and what it's capable of. Mm -hmm. um, and even I am not, a good coder. I mean, I basically stopped at basic on the Commodore 64, so uh, you do not want me programming your game. Um, and when I work with developers, I'll be like, great, we're going to make a game just X and Z and Y and it's awesome, and then they come back and like, with 5% of it, we can do that. Um, and, and, and I don't, you know, if I, if I had gone to school for engineering, maybe I would be able to push that 5% to 7%, or maybe I'd be able to say, well, this 5% matters to me, and I'm gonna do this 5% instead. Um, because I, when we were at a school today, this great school um, in Santa Monica um, called Playmaker, which is a school, it's for sixth graders now, a charter school, where they learn everything through games, but they're not just playing games, they're designing games. So it's like, oh, we're gonna learn about ancient Greek uh, history, um, where, you know, make, make a game. What would, what would it be a game about ancient Greeks? So we're learning about probability, make a game that involves chance. And they're learning all about system design and does this, you know, what, is, what do the different parts mean in the system? And if you change the rules, how does it affect fairness and equity and justice mm -hmm. in the game? And they're learning to think like system designers. And you can apply that to social justice. You can apply it to the environment. You can apply it to politics, apply it to business and enterprise thinking like, so it's very much coding. It's just, it's coding and rules design. It's very much, um, if you can build the system, mm. you can change what's possible. You determine what the, what the rules are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that their work is the number of female, not only coders, but female game designers is also shockingly low? Yes. Yeah, if there were a higher number, would we, would we have different games and would we have different ways we were connecting with the internet, for instance? What would that look like? I mean, you can, see, you can see in the work now where there are female leads, a wider range of emotions being explored. Um, games about sacrificing yourself for someone you love. Um, this great game called The End of Us um, that's won some attention, uh, female game design lead, um, where uh, the most heroic thing you can do is not to be an opponent, but to sacrifice yourself for the friend you're playing with without them 
knowing that's what you're doing. It's really beautiful. Um, so I think there'd probably be a wider range of, um, we see a wider range of emotions and actions that are considered win states. You know, domination is not necessarily the win state or collecting the most assets is not. Um, sometimes in our games we try to oh, award um, people who are given out the most stuff. So like, we don't, yeah, maybe you've amassed 10,000 of this currency, but if you still have 10,000 at the end of the game, you lose. Like, you're supposed to be getting rid of it as fast as you can to help other people have a better experience. So um, I think women could help imagine different win conditions. I wonder if there's any questions in the audience. <laughs> Sir? I've been to a number of conferences where the creatives in the film and theater business meet the creatives from the game industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a polarity there sometimes. The gamers say, games are games, they are not films, and the films say they're never the twain shell. Uh, opinion? Um, yeah, people get really uptight about that um, in the arts because I think we want to focus on what an art can do that something else can't do. So what people say games can do that no other medium can do is it's about meaningful decision making. That's what they always say games do. And you can't go watch, if I watch someone else's movie, that the director and all the producers have decided what my experience will be. But a game is about me deciding my experience. But I think games and theater are very close. Um, increasingly so uh, in, in a lot of um, uh, site-specific theater or um, you know even with what what you're doing with another where there's a discussion after every performance is that right there's a people are going to be able to debate what it means and debate the choices and strategies the same way you would do like a debrief on a game you know well, why did you do that and did that work I think people are gonna be able to have that kind of an interactive quality so I feel like yeah movies and games I'm not so sure but but games and theater I think there's a sense of um, social uh, and, and wanting to they, there's a lot of good experiments going on between the two I'm also wondering like what, if I were to write a video game what would that be because gaming is I mean you guys have probably heard the statistics. I mean, the gaming industry makes more than the movie industry. I, I think. Um, I had no idea. Wow. Oh yes. Oh yes, yes, yes. And so many of the, especially the, you know, younger folks are, or are just completely. I mean, even I, I think we've even, even though I play games, we know about games. Like, I don't feel like I'm interacting with game environments the way um, kids today are. And I don't think it's all, I really don't think it's all a bad thing. And, and, but I've wondered, like, if I were to write a game, what would that game be? Um, there was a really interesting game. Have you heard of Heavy Rain? Mm -hmm. And that one is like this noir game, and you play different characters, and you really have to, and what I liked about it, I didn't get to play it to the end, but I, my friend did, so I heard what the end is. Really, the decisions you make in it do affect the ending. It's not like at all; it's all leading down towards the same ending. There, are, there are many endings, many of them grim, and if you don't kind of like pilot your way through this whole storyline um, in a certain fashion um, and, and make choices based on based based on emotion and based on compassion, then you have very different outcomes. Um, it's also kind of it's nice and moody and textured. Yeah. Right at my dark little alley, but um. and that is the game that's often held up as most aspiring to cinematic goals. I just heard this great sort of um, rant against Heavy Rain as being as it should throw off its pretensions to to being filmic um, and this ruining the game industry. So there's a lot of uh, you know what we enjoy like filmic makes makes yeah I know it makes people crazy. There's a hand all the way in the back. Your TED talk is so fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Jane has a fantastic TED talk. It's easy to find. Watch it. <laughs> I think it is so cool that your doctorate is in performance studies. Even though it's a Berkeley, I would hold that. Ah ha ha. What, did you like go to Stanford or something? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm so uh, fascinated. I'd love to know how your work in performance studies has informed your work in technology and gaming. Yeah, um, so this is, I mean, this is one reason why we bonded, I think. Um, I went to grad school, I was going to study physicists and how they um, do their research, 
um, which is, sounds stupid in retrospect um, because it, I tried, it wasn't that interesting. Uh, nobody wanted to read the research. But um, <laughs> when I got out to Berkeley, um, there's a startup company called The Go Game saying they wanted to bring games to the streets and there would be um, you know, plants and cafes that you'd have to interact with. They'd be characters, they'd give them missions, they'd like stage props in trees, you have to unlock boxes, and it'd be like a raft, and you blow it up, you have to throw it out to the middle of a lake, and there'd be a thing underneath, you put a snorkel on, and read a code. And I was like, they need a stage manager. And I've been doing um, <laughs> stage managing in New York City before I went to grad school. Um, and I also had a background in parks and recreation, doing big festivals and like Easter egg hunts for 30,000 people in Central Park. So I'm like, you need me, I'll like manage your, you know, play for you and uh, got involved in games that way um, and, and, and wound up actually um, writing a lot of the game missions, like designing what would players be doing. And um, what changed my course of study was people would play this game in a neighborhood they'd never been in, in San Francisco, and then they would say things like, you played it for a day. They say, like, three months later, they're in the neighborhood they want to talk to everybody, they're being super extroverted because somebody like might have a clue for them or they're like reading all the graffiti or they're going to strange alleys. Like that sense of adventure and curiosity, with them. even they knew, they knew the game was over, it permanently changed how they interacted with that space. Um, and so I was like, wait, could we do this intentionally? Could we change people's behaviors and mindsets and openness to other people and experiences on purpose? Um, so, but that's that's how, um, and and uh, that that wound up changed, convincing my department to let me um, do that instead of physics. They didn't seem too upset by that change. <laughs> <laughs> Way better idea. Um, so. Games, I mean, gaming is so much about improvisation. I think improv is kind of the lightest type of theater. So there is there is definitely that like yeah. forms. Any other questions? Yes. Um, was it random? Oh, was that the study? I don't know. That's what you're looking for. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, Super Better is great, by the way. Um, and, um, Super Better is a game that Jane designed, which you can also learn about easily. Um, uh, so, what, do you have any, do you think you guys have any comments on Sherry Circle? And, you yeah, know, I hear you. Oh, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. And you were talking about, like, if you do have this sort of, whatever we call it, false reality, yeah. whatever experience with love and do you do you follow was Sherry Turkle's work? Uh, Sherry Turkle, whom I don't know, so you'll have to explain to yeah, us who um, that is. She's a great professor. Um, I believe she's still at MIT, if that's right. Um, and she wrote a book called Alone Together um, about how digital technologies are kind of turning our strong social relationship into weaker social relationships, and that mediation is creating um, a less rich meaningful sense of um, social interaction, basically. I mean, typical. But like particularly with the kids and how they perceive digital devices and as, as being, like empathetically. So the relationships with children to their, to their devices as opposed to persons. She doesn't like the projection of emotion, so um, that like we might be um, nurturing a, a virtual pet in a, in a game and project some kind of love and, and, and that that's some kind of a real, she, d she does not like that. Now, it's kind of like Morris. It's kind of like the character from. Right, yeah, right. Who, right, who wonders yeah. if she, yes. Um, so, you know, I think it would be really, I mean, okay, so I don't get into, I've never actually had a debate or discussion with her, um, but would creating a nurturing relationship with a virtual object sort of ingrain those ways of thinking, wire the brain when you're young to nurturing and empathy, um, and make you more likely to feel that way about a real person or real animal? My guess would be yes, based on what I know um, from how things work. So um, I would, you know, I would, if I had kids and they spent all their time, you know, playing games, taking care of little creatures and making them happy and fed and teaching them things and, and I, that would make me not not too worried. I'd probably get them a real dog too. But um, <laughs> but I think that constant repetition of that um, instinct to care and protect um, is meaningful. And you see that starting to overlap with real things. There are um, environmental projects where 
um, it measures, what did I, I just saw this. Um, it's, a, it's like a piece of paper that you can put on the wall. Is this at MIT too, I think? And when you walk by it, it measures that you're taking the stairs instead of um, the elevator. And it feeds, every time somebody in the office walks by it, it feeds this virtual um, plant that gets green and grows flowers and people take the elevator instead, it withers and dies. And so um, you, could, you could kind of combine. It's digital paper, did anybody, I just saw this and I can't remember, I was at a, I'm gonna remember, I was at the university and they showed it to me. Kish, where was I in like the last two weeks? No, it was at a school. I'm gonna think of this, I'll remember. There was a hand, was there a hand? Yes. Um, one of my favorite articles I ever read about thinking about games was on crack.com, I don't know if you know, but it was John Cheese's six things I learned from watching my kids play games. Mm. Um, and it was the typical cracks, mostly from laughs, lots of swear words, and focus on dead baby humor. Um, literally in one case. <clears throat> but he talked about watching his kids play Fable, Grand Theft Auto, and uh, have you, guys thought about that at all, the whole watching kids and the way they interact with technology and how does that affect your work? I mean, I watched my brother interact with it and I, for me it was the amount of time he was doing it, it wasn't what he was doing. I mean, I would get, I would see what he was doing and he was like, you know, level ultra, ultra wizard this and that because he'd been playing for so long and, and I was kind of all, I was amazed with, um, with the look of the game, and he clearly had friends in the game. Um, and then I, you know, then I played Halo with my other brother, and you just blowing up aliens, and you know, it was really fun for a little while. So I don't, you know, gaming itself, I think is, I think is a lot of fun, and and how we interact with it. Have y'all seen any of the? Um, any of the shots of like people's faces when they're playing games? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think you bring, you bring this up in your book yeah, too. Yeah. And there's some I saw a Kickstarter campaign about oh, recently. Did yes, I was that? yeah tweeting about that's a good one. The immersion project. Yeah. yeah they're going to put the, you actually might be interested in this. They're going to put cameras um, and allow people all over the world to turn on the webcam when they're watching anything streaming listening to music or playing games. And they're gonna try to capture the emotional faces of being immersed in something you love. I don't know if they're gonna do it with reading. Like if you were reading, uh, I don't think most people read like the digital books on. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a uh, Robbie Cooper, uh, his project. Yeah, um, that would be great because we could literally watch. Um, the, the other, th I, I read this great article about, uh, you know, kids and failure. I think that's the most interesting thing to watch is, um, are kids playing games that make them more resilient to failure? Um, will they try that Angry Birds level, you know, a hundred times till they get three stars? Um, or do they get frustrated and walk away? When parents ask me, you know, how do I know if this is a good game for my kid or not? I would, I would say one thing you can look for, you might not understand what's going on in the game, but are they failing a lot and keep trying? And Halo, Halo can actually be good, you know, for that too. Um, and do they develop new strategies and do they, um, they, they, we watch kids playing this game today where they're learning math. They don't know they're learning math. Um, they're learning algebra, actually, but it, it doesn't look like it because they're monsters. And uh, <laughs> they would say things like, oh, this level's really annoying. Oh, it's so annoying. Play, 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 play. Oh. This is the worst. Play, 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 play. Um, Whereas if they were just doing math, they might just... They crumple it up and walk away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can watch for that. And, uh, and that's, I think, you know... If something's really hard and they're still doing it four hours later, you, that's good. That's good. Don't take it away, you know. We were down. talking earlier, I don't know if you've been around any two or three year olds recently, but if they come up, up on a flat glass surface, they will automatically try to swipe and touch it. <laughs> and kind of, it's yeah. kind of amazing. It's the new way of interacting. We're also talking about someone we know who's very leery of letting his children play a lot of video games. And you know, I was wondering if, because this whole generation is going to be running companies running the world, and if they have a way of interacting with technology or a way of thinking that games allow them easy access to it. So you didn't grow up with that if you're at a disadvantage. Could I actually, I was just thinking with these questions, I'd love to ask the audience a question, to do a quick yeah. survey, because I'm just based on our conversation. Do, would, you, would you raise your hand if you think you are likely in your lifetime to spend more time in the future 
in something that is a virtual world, like not physical reality, you think you will spend more time in that kind of world in, in your future, not the rest of the world, you personally, uh, than you have in the past. And uh, with, I, would, I would say some kind of a virtual world where you may not know who you're with, you know, not, not a shared space and you're not directing directly. How many people do not think they're going to spend more time in a world like that? Like, not for me, you're not going to do it. You see, I think this is, this is a, yeah, because we have this idea that it's like our fantasy to have this environment, but I find most people, it's actually their nightmare. And I can't figure out why we keep making technologies that get us closer to this when, whenever you ask, a majority of people will be like, not going to do it. But we keep making the technology like we want that to happen. And your play is kind of like the apotheosis of that dream fulfilled. Why are we doing it? I, I mean, I think it's interesting. And even, you know, the most popular movie about this, The Matrix, it's The Matrix is actually kind of a scary place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Why are we, I don't know, maybe we have keep... any thoughts on why we're driving towards this future? Mm -hmm. Yes, Phyllis. Really. My question is, when you ask that question, I wonder if, uh, I hate to admit it, but I think might have been an age division. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so I wonder if the reason these things being created is because younger people uh, who everybody TV caters to, all the advertisers cater to. So yeah. And is it we the more mediation you're born with, the more you're potentially open to, so at some point we'll just be past that curve where everybody wants? Maybe. I mean I don't want it. Like I'll just be on the record. I mean maybe I want it when I'm like very close to the end of life, but I don't want it before then. So I don't know. Uh, yeah. This is to answer um, Jane's question. I think Edward Castronova would have said that in a virtual economy, in a virtual world, the reason we're so attracted to it is because if you do the work and you work really, really hard and you stay on course, you actually get the reward. Yeah. Real life doesn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. And as long as we can we'll manufacture and generate that, yeah. why wouldn't we choose that, especially as the population grows, especially as it gets harder out there? I mean, that's to me, that seems inevitable. So there's more abundance and more um, reason to be optimistic in, in that world. It just makes sense of your efforts. Where in the you know in so much of the world your efforts can lead to nothing. Mm -hmm. you, you can you can be a billionaire and it can all be taken away. But if you do the quest, you can repeat that. And that I mean, right, right. How can you resist that? That's great. So in the real world, if you're a billionaire, it can all be taken away. But if you're on a quest, you can keep repeating. Unless an investigator decides. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> to come after you. We have time for a couple more questions. I'm going to get this gentleman here. Well, isn't it really a lack of uh, enough of a, a full life of your own that drives you toward trying to find more richness in a virtual world? I imagine that's the fact. I mean, a, a kid who spends all his time on a video game has no life other than that. So, therefore, he wants this life that he can see that someone else has imagined for him. There's so much out there, but you have to work at it just to uh, experience it. Is that right, is, Jane? Is there a correlation between the lack of quality of real life and the amount of time kids spend in gaming? Um, gaming increases with depression um, for for young people. Um, so there, it's. Uh, I don't know if there's a life time, just because you get on the trajectory doesn't mean you're doomed forever, I guess. For adults who are going through difficult divorces, that's another predictor of um, uptake, like sort of sudden loss of, um, of social support system that you might have going through divorce. Um, I think the question is, and I hear this from parents all the time, or grandparents who say, you know, my son or my daughter or my granddaughter, They've thrown away five years of their lives on this game. Um, is there any way we can see that time as being time in service of something? So, you know, um, I mean, I had some rough time growing up where I was had a lot of anxiety and depression, and I probably, you know, read books or whatever. Um, but can we look for some kids or young adults as 
this was, this was a choice that they made to try to stay motivated, feel socially connected, create a sense of meaning and purpose when it was difficult for them, and that maybe they're be they're, they will be better able to connect with your opportunity in the future. It's, it's a slippery slope because they need to get back into reality at some point, but I'd like to not tell gamers that there's some, something they've thrown away that they'll never get back to try to say, you know, this was, this was smart for you, you got on the raft, the life raft or whatever, um, and something you were doing during that time period can now be put in service of finding a real job or um, finding the love of your life or whatever it might be. I, I'd really like to change the conversation just to make sure we don't um, make it worse by saying, and they do this in South Korea. South is actually shamed. Yeah, they shame the gamers and say, that's it, you've ruined your life, the end. But isn't that dependent on the design of the game? It depends what they're doing. If they're spending five years killing aliens, then maybe that statement doesn't hold true. But if you have a game that's designed to increase um, their intelligence or their, like you said, their philanthropic uh, endeavors, then maybe that wasn't a waste. But that kind of seems like it comes down to the design of the game. Well, if they're if it's a, if they're playing, you know, if they're playing Halo, it's four players and they're collaborating and doing real time coordination. That could be beneficial. Um, you know, there's a tendency to be spectrum. Uh, multiplayer is better than single player, typically. Co op's better than competitive. If you're playing single player, games that are really hard for you that you fail a lot at are better than games that are easy. And games where you create rather than destroy, like Minecraft, are, can be better. Or Sim, The Sim City, or something like that. There's statistics about, um, I'm sorry, I'm jumping into another question, about first person and third person. Do you have any data on that, it? whether it's more engaging or any other benefits? Yeah, I don't, I, I, I've never seen um, real life impacts on first person versus third. The, the, I've seen clinical trials of third person fantasy shooter games that you know have tremendous like six months real life impact in changing behavior, which was surprising because we think, oh, first person will be more immersive. Um, and even that Stanford thing is a third person where you're flying and you're a superhero, that's third person, not first person. So um, anyway, it just might be counterintuitive that third person might actually be more convincing than first person because you're seeing a representation of yourself. Uh, and Joy, for our final, final question. Um, it wasn't a qu it was just a comment. I mean, I thought for the first time, like, um, so this question about whether the angsty 14-year-old is spending all their time online, whether they're throwing that time away, and I realized um, I was an angsty 14-year-old. I did not, I mean, I didn't really play video games, but I played theater games. Like, I got to do a theater class. And I was so shy, but like, playing those games, which didn't feed into anything, you know, like, I didn't like, helps cure cancer like some games are doing or didn't do anything, but it made me feel um, connected to the people in my class and it made me feel confident. And that changed me, mm -hmm. which, uh, which is like the effect of it going forward. Can I ask Jennifer a question? Please. Without going into the plot at all, do you feel like any of your characters are changed for the better as a result of their virtual experiences and play? In, in sort of in the, the line of things that look look bad for us might be good for us? In the short run, no. In the long run, yes, <laughs> I think, for these characters. That's going to be a good question for the concierges to ask yeah, in yeah. discussions yeah. afterwards. That's a great question. <laughs> yes. um, uh, Jane has agreed to sign some of her books that we're selling here for $15. Thank you, Jane. So we'll set up a table for her. And it's it's actually, you know, it's a book for me that is so joyful. Your book is really yeah. joyful, and I really appreciate that about it. So uh, I would like to thank our two wonderful guests for joining us this evening. <laughs> at the Kirk Douglas Theater down the street. And we have some wine and water for you, so please hang out and chat with us for a few minutes. You've got extra time. Thank you. <laughs>